Uh, good morning, and I'd like to welcome members to the first meeting uh, in 2018 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, our first item today is to invite a new member of the committee to declare any relevant interests. Uh, Elaine Smith has uh, joined us to replace El Claire Baker, MSP. Thank you very much, convener. Yeah, can I just put on the record that I'm a non-remunerated director of McQuick Bagpipe Covers? Thank you, Elaine, and welcome to the committee. Um, agenda item two is for the committee to agree to take agenda item seven in private. This item is an opportunity for the committee to discuss the evidence heard in today's meeting on the committee's inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct. Do members agree to take this item in private? Thank you. Our next item is for the committee to agree that its consideration of evidence heard and a draft report on its inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct should be taken in private at future meetings. Do members agree to take these items in private in future meetings? Thank you. We move now on to agenda item four, and it's for the committee to take evidence on two proposed cross-party groups. The first group we have to consider today is the proposed CPG on autism, and I'd like to welcome Graeme Day, MSP, to the meeting. Graeme is the deputy convener of the group, and I'd like to invite Graeme to make an opening statement about the purpose of the group. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, I think there's been a feeling for some time in the autism community, and perhaps also amongst MSPs, that the lack of a, an autism cross-party group in the Parliament was a missed opportunity to raise awareness of autism issues. I'm conscious I think there was one two Parliaments ago. Uh, there are around 58,000 uh, people in Scotland, uh, young people and adults, that uh, are identified as having autism, plus more than 174,000 uh, family members and carers. Personally, I suspect the numbers are considerably higher than that in reality. So I think there's a, a queer constituency there, as it were, to have the interests of uh, highlighted. The uh, Scottish Government's strategy um, on autism identifies autism as a national priority. Um, however, I think as all of us as MSPs from our surgery caseload, I would suspect, would recognise that in reality, very often the needs of this group are not being adequately met at the moment. So granted the committee's approval today, the cross-party group will seek to bring together individuals, organisations and parliamentarians who have a shared interest in this area uh, to promote the interests of autistic people, their families and their carers at the Parliament, and obviously with a view to influencing Scottish Government policy and, and improving the lives of this group. Um, as members will be aware, autism is often diagnosed alongside other conditions, some of which are currently uh, the subject of a dedicated cross-party group at the Parliament. Uh, for example, there are presently CPGs on dyslexia, epilepsy, mental health and learning disability. Uh, it will be the case that these CPGs undertake work that will be relevant to autistic people, absolutely. However, as stated in the Scottish Strategy for Autism, autistic people, and I quote, have a unique set of conditions which will not necessarily fall within the categories of learning disabilities or mental health, although these conditions may be present. So it's because of the fact that the needs arising from autism are distinct and are currently not being met that a standalone CPG on autism we feel is required, although, of course, where opportunities to work collaboratively with other CPGs uh, will be explored. Um, it's proposed that the CPG on autism will take place quarterly. Each session would be an hour and a half to two hours long. Uh, in this time, the group would discuss up to two topics at each CPG meeting. In the first 12 months, it's proposed that the group will discuss mental health, education, diagnosis and service provision. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr Day. Um, do members have any questions? Alexander. Thank you, Convener. I, I think it's very good that you identify that there may well be some crossover uh, because autism has been seen as a, as a learning disability. Uh, but I think that you've given us a good example of why it should be a standalone, uh, and, I, and I, I would concur with that. But can I maybe ask about some examples of joint work that you may choose to do with other CPGs that would then give you that opportunity to develop and then get your own platform uh, going forward? Um, I think we're very open-minded on that. Um, I think it's really 
uh, it's going to be up to the group to identify areas of, of cooperation. I wouldn't want to prejudge what those participating in the group would perhaps see as being important. There are some fairly obvious things that, that strike me, but I'd, I'd um, be guided by what the membership felt. Um, but absolutely, we've seen good examples in the Parliament across party groups working together. I think that's absolutely the way forward for this one, if you approve it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, convener. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Day. Could I ask you about the the fact that there's no individual members listed on your initial application for the group? The reason I want to ask you about that is um, you are indeed right. There was a previous autism uh, cross party group. Indeed, I was the, coincidentally the convener of it when it was disbanded. Um, partly that was due to the parliamentary nature of the cross party group being lost. And I think, though, under the new rules that the Parliament has now, then that would probably be less of an issue. But I did want to just ask you, um, do you intend to have individual members or are you just going to have MSPs and organisations? Um, I think that's a really good question because I, I am aware of previous issues around the CPG. Um, and what I would say in relation to that, if I can answer that point, is yes, the rules have changed. But I think also there is opportunity. I think some CPGs have a code of conduct around how they operate. And I think that's perhaps a, an area we would consider. In terms of individuals, um, I think that's something, again, that will be up to the group to decide if you approve it. And we, you're right, there are no individuals listed at the moment. Um, but this is about reaching out to um, as many people as we can. Um, but I would give you the assurance that we will be circumspect and and uh, how the group is uh, taken forward. If I might just comment, convener, slightly further, I think sometimes it, it's just that um, cross-party groups can become confused with public meetings and the parliamentary nature of them, and that can cause difficulty. So I, I think that's why I've asked that question, really. Yes, I, and I would say to your answer that, that we are acutely aware of, of that possibility and uh, mindful of how we might uh, address that issue going forward with your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Do members have any other questions? No. Thank you for coming along today, uh, Mr Day. Um, we will consider uh, approval of, of the cross-party group in private session further on in the meeting, um, and we'll let you know in due course. Thank and you very much. And briefly to allow witnesses to change. Uh, thank you. The second group for the committee's consideration is the proposed cross-party group on life sciences. And I would like to welcome Kenneth Gibson, MSP, to the meeting. Uh, Kenneth is the convener of the group. Um, and I would like to invite you to make an opening statement about the purposes of the group. Uh, thank you very much, convener. And thank you for inviting me uh, along this morning. Uh, the life sciences comprise the branches of science that involve the scientific study of living organisms, such as microorganisms, plants, animals and human beings, as well as related considerations like bioethics. The Scottish Government has identified the life sciences industry as a key growth sector of the Scottish economy in recognition of both the current contribution and the enormous potential of the sector for Scotland. Not only does this cutting-edge science-based industry constantly push the limits of research and application, it's a significant contribution to Scotland, generating around £2,600 million in gross value added and employing 37,000 people across Scotland. There was a cross-party group in the last Parliament, and I was asked to uh, reconvene it. Uh, in terms of what the, the CPG will actually do, it will act as a channel for communications and information between the Scottish Parliament and people within organisations working in the life sciences sector in Scotland, including industry, academia, research and manufacturing. It will identify and discuss policy areas of particular relevance to the life sciences sector and support the delivery of the Scottish Life Sciences Strategy as set out in the Life Sciences Scottish Industry Leadership Group. And we'll work with Scottish parliamentarians to ensure the skill set required to deliver the Scottish Life Sciences Strategy is acknowledged and met, including positively addressing the challenges of women into science. And uh, we want to enable the life sciences sector from across Scotland to showcase the world-class work 
in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, we had our initial meeting on the 28th of November with Professor Graham uh, um, Roy Fraser, of, uh, uh, sorry, Graham Roy of the Fraser Valander Institute, speaking to the 2018 Economic Impact Report uh, on the pharmaceutical sector in Scotland. And we elected two deputy conveners uh, that night, and I was elected convener. Uh, we've got two further meetings proposed uh, on the 29th of March. Um, uh, our theme is Life Sciences for All. Let's not miss out on 50% of the workforce. And Dame Anne Glover, President of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, will present on her views as to barriers and opportunities to life sciences for females. Dr Barbara Blaney of BioCity and uh, Athena Swan um, will present on opportunities in life science from an industrial and academic perspective. And a female apprentice of GSK Manufacturing will present on her motivations to follow science as a career, although we haven't identified who that individual is just yet. And then on the 28th of June, um, we will discuss the life sciences strategy for Scotland 2025 vision. Uh, and we've invited the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy and Dr David Tudor to showcase success and discuss future challenges in reaching the Scottish vision of life sciences. So that's the situation at the moment. Happy to take any much, questions. Mr. Gibson. Um, do members have any questions? Patrick. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, just looking through the, the list of organisations uh, proposed as, as members, um, obviously quite a long list, a uh, large number of, of organisations clearly showing an interest. Uh, so some of these I'm familiar with and some of them I'm not. I'm just wondering uh, if you can tell us what proportion are uh, private companies with commercial interests in the subjects that will be discussed as opposed to academic or other organisations that, that don't necessarily fall in that category and, yeah. and whether that aspect raises any issues for the cross We've still got uh, organisations and, and academics, etc., looking to join. But at the inaugural meeting, we had around 40 people there, um, um, nine MSPs, and it was about two-thirds academic, about one-third commercial, actually, at that meeting that was there. There was quite a lot of inter There's quite a lot of interaction, though they're not in two separate groups. Many of the academics actually work very closely with the sector um, on the, the commercial development, for example, of new innovative products. For example, we had a presentation on a, a revolution in new uh, um, a medical crystal being developed by an organisation called CMAC it's with Strathclyde University at Strathclyde University, and that will be a world-leading um, pharmaceutical development if, if it comes to fruition. So it's very difficult really to separate them out, but um, you you actually have a very tight relationship between the private sector and academia, and that will uh, clearly be reflected in the group. Eileen. Thanks, convener, um, and good morning. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, having read this, I was, uh, it was something that you mentioned, Mr Gibson, that in the last session there was a group um, on life science, but I wondered in the last session, was there a group on science and technology? And is it perhaps, were both of those groups running at the same time in the last session, do you know? Uh, I wasn't aware of any group on science and technology, I have to say, uh, um, perhaps because I was involved in other areas, but certainly I don't believe there's any crossover that I'm aware of in this parliament in terms okay. of cross-party working. I mean, I, I do understand that, that there can be a lot of overlap in cross-party groups. I know that's an issue that the, this committee has looked at, uh, certainly uh, before, although often I feel that when there is um, a, a, an overlap, it, it, it does uh, give an opportunity for sometimes for cross-party group um, working uh, working together, for example, in the last session, I, I, uh, the, the group I convened, the, the cross back group in epilepsy, met with uh, Malcolm Chisholm's cross back group on mental health and we had a joint session. So sometimes, even when there is an overlap, it, it can actually um, be synergistic, um, you know, rather than, rather than duplica duplicative. Could I ask a further question, convener? Thanks very much. Um, yes, and also identifying the... the policy areas. One of the main areas for the group seems to be to support the delivery of Scottish life sciences strategy. So could you explain a bit more about that? Is that um, the Scottish Government strategy? Well, it's really, well, the Scottish Government uh, strategy really dovetails with industry strategy. Because life sciences is a very, is a, a rapidly um, growing sector across the world, and it's also a, a sector which involves um, very close cooperation, as already mentioned, with the academic sector. And it's about trying to, to ensure that as this sector develops, Scotland um, not only is part of that, but actually helps lead the way in terms of technical innovation. And the reason for that is obviously to try and stimulate uh, investment and employment into Scotland. One of the things that we heard, for example, at the um, 
inaugural meeting was that some 80% of research and development in the UK and this industry goes into the southeast of England and London, but it only produces 40% of the of the products, whereas Scotland um, uh, has much less a much lower level of investment, but much higher productivity and is much more innovative in terms of what it, it, it produces. And so it's trying to kind of capitalise on Scotland's excellent reputation in research and development to attract the, um, more of these uh, high um, um, you know, these uh, these kind of innovative research and development companies that will invest and create jobs and prosperity here in Scotland. And so that kind of ties in with the Scottish Government's strategy, which is to double uh, employment and investment in Scotland over the next decade in this industry. Jamie. Thank you very much, Kavita. Um, <coughs> I met with uh, representatives of Scotland's <coughs> life, um, life sciences industry only a few days ago, and I absolutely recognise the importance of it. One of the things you mentioned here um, is the... Uh, is the group would look to address the challenges of women in science. Uh, none of the organisations that are listed here are uh, specifically deal with getting more women into uh, science or representing women in science or encouraging uh, young women to get into STEM subjects. I was just wondering whether you'd be looking to in include or encourage some of those to get involved kind of going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a very good question. I have to say that 90% of the people at the inaugural meeting were male, and that's why our next meeting is specifically on this issue. Uh, I, um, I, I attended uh, last year an event that the First Minister spoke at in Kilwinnie College called This Ayrshire Girl Can, which is specifically about trying to get young, uh, young women in, uh, to be interested in science, even from primary and secondary level. And we had all sorts of um, individual uh, young women who are working in aircraft manufacture and in pharmaceuticals and even fixing turbines to show, ex not just to talk about it, but to give examples of what they do. Um, what, 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 that's why when we're having this meeting, we're actually going to have an apprentice to actually talk about what she will do. But, we've, we've, but we're making it quite clear at this meeting that we cannot possibly reach our full potential in this industry, or indeed many others, if the 50% of the population, or 52% who are female, do not uh, play their full role within it. So there's a real uh, interest within the group to, to try and redress the balance and get many more um, uh, young women uh, and probably older women into this uh, this industry because it's also a very productive industry, pays good wages, get good uh, um, um, terms and conditions. So. Uh, I think it's an industry that a lot of women, I would hope, would want to work in. And what we want to do is to get our member organisations um, uh, to take that forward, if you like. Um, and that's why we're going to start our first full, hopefully, if the if the the CPG is um, is is uh, registered. Um, that's why we're focused on this really important issue. Great. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Camina. Mr. Gibson. What role do you see the group contributing to Scotland's 2025 vision? Well, what we want to do is to try, well, I think what we want to do is, re is interact very closely with the, the, the Scottish Government. So, for example, Paul Wheelhouse will come to our June meeting, that's the idea. And prior to that, what I've asked uh, member organisations to do is to set him a list of, of questions as to what their issues and concerns are and how we can actually take this forward successfully. I, I would want him to have those questions a week or two beforehand so that he could answer them on the day. And then member organisations and individuals who are about the group would be able to ask further questions so that we ensure that everyone's basically singing from the same hymn sheet so we can actually take the strategy forward to, to, together. And if there's any issues or glitches with the strategy, perhaps the Scottish Government might want to actually look again at how they can improve one aspect or two aspects or whatever they need to do. So it's all about cooperation and working together and trying to take the industry uh, forward. Um, uh, and do you see it challenging the vision as well? Of course it will. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think the cross party groups here to kind of, you know, uh, to, to sit like nodding donkeys and agree whatever the Scottish Government's saying. I think it's there too. And we won't because our two deputy conveners are both Conservative uh, MSPs. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, um, I'm hoping to get a, a, a wider. Um, um, we're hoping to get people from other parties to take office bearer positions with that situation at the moment. So I'm pretty sure that we will actually challenge the mm -hmm. Scottish Government because it's in all our interest to ensure we've got the best possible strategy and uh, the best performing life sciences industry. Thank you. Kate. One of the challenges that I have identified in cross-party groups is getting the geographical representation because for people from the Highlands and Islands um, to get here um, or from the West Coast, it takes a long time and most, therefore they choose not to and we have we don't have a very good uh, video conferencing um, uh, set up. 
Um, life sciences is uh, of particular interest in the Highlands and Islands. It's a growing industry in the Highlands and Islands, an area of growth. How would you intend to make sure that uh, all geographical regions are represented on the cross-party group? Well, to be honest, I haven't discussed that, and I think that would have to be a matter I would have to take to the group rather than just make up an answer off the top of my head. I think it's important to discuss such things with colleagues. Um, but I, I mean, video conferencing is something I've never experienced at a cross-party group, but it might be something we can look at. I wouldn't see why we couldn't. I mean, the, 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 the life sciences industry is, a, um, as you pointed out, right across Scotland. I mean, for example, GSK are in North Ayrshire, uh, not my own constituency, but even constituency, but they also have, um, you know, um, a very strong footprint, for example, in Trows, and we've got lots of um, uh, bioscience industry in Lothian, in Lanarkshire, etc., etc., and indeed the Highlands. So I think that might be something we could uh, we could certainly look at. It's certainly an idea I'll take back to the group and see what they have to say about it. Thank you uh, for attending the meeting today, Mr Gibson. We will consider your application at Agenda Item 6 and we'll contact you in due course. About Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you to Thank the committee. You. And I'll suspend briefly to change witnesses. Our next agenda item today is an evidence session on the committee's inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct. Joining us today are Susan Duffy, Head of Committees and Outreach, Lorna Foreman, Head of Organisational Development, and David McGill, Assistant Chief Executive of the Scottish Parliament. And I'd like to invite Susan Duffy to make an opening statement. Thanks very much, Convener, and thank you very much for the invitation to come along this morning. Um, to give a bit of context, it's always been really important to us that the Parliament is a place where people feel safe and valued and, and respected. So building on what we'd already done, we published a diversity and inclusion strategy last year. And as part of that, we have set up networks where people can discuss issues and barriers that they might face. We have set up a, a women in leadership programme and we uh, published a comprehensive gender pay gap report and an action plan to, to reduce that gap. And all of these issues are overseen by what we call our diversity and inclusion board. And David and I co-chair that board. I also want to say that the Parliament takes a zero tolerance approach to harassment and our dignity at work policy makes that clear. So given all of that, it was really important to us that we reacted swiftly when the media reports of sexual harassment um, first emerged. Now, our immediate priority was to ensure that anybody who was suffering from harassment had the advice, uh, the advice and support that they needed. So we set up a dedicated confidential um, helpline to offer information and guidance about how people could report any concerns and ways to get further support. And the presiding officer also convened a meeting with uh, party leaders because to tackle this kind of behaviour, we need to work collectively and we need to have a unified approach across the parliament as an institution and also individual political parties. And at that meeting, all of the parties reaffirmed the zero tolerance uh, approach to sexual harassment. Um, now, the number of reported uh, incidents of harassment has been low over the lifetime of the, the parliament. But it's really important to find out whether that actually reflects the, sc the scale of the problem or whether it reflects a culture where people don't feel able to, to report something. So we issued a confidential anonymous survey to everyone who works in and for the parliament and the survey closes tomorrow and the results will be analysed by an independent company who are undertaking the survey on our behalf. Now, the next steps will be largely dependent on what that survey tells us, and we're aiming to publish both the survey results and an action plan in March. 
Now, the SPCB, we've just come from that this morning, agreed this morning that to do this, we'll set up a joint working group to take forward any actions arising from the survey, and that we envisage the group will include parliament officials, representatives from each of the political parties, and we'll also have Emma Rich from Engender, who's been invaluable to us uh, thus far. We're committed to taking this work forward and to making sure that we have a workplace where people do feel safe, valued and respected. I hope that helps give some context and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Susan, for, for that opening statement. Can I ask, just to really set the scene, if you could talk us through the process of what would happen in a hypothetical investigation, so if someone comes to you with a complaint, <coughs> would they, what the process then is? as it currently stands? Yeah. Now, as you can probably imagine in, uh, in this building, the, the, the number of processes are quite complex because we have a number of employers within here, so there are a number of different routes where people can take um, complaints. And I know that, that Lorna will be able to, to talk in maybe more detail about some of the ways in which we will take complaints yeah. forward. Is that my... It's okay, because it's automatic. So if there's a complaint by um, a member staff about their employee member under... Um, the, the contract of employment, it would be raised with the employing member because under employment law, that is the route that you would take. However, in those circumstances, if a member staff um, was raising issues of sexual harassment, for example, the HR function would um, be involved in that and we would be advising the, the member to appoint an independent third party to do the investigation and to deal with the complaint. So that would be the route, and that's what we have done in the past in those circumstances. So, just so so I'm I'm, I'm clear here. So, if a, if a member of staff complained about a, a, an MSP yes. sexually harassing them or harassing them in any other way, they would contact in the past. They would have contacted HR, and so HR would then advise. The, the member, I, I'm just not, I'm, I'm oh, not sure. Yeah, I could go in the detail. So under the contract of employment, so there, there's different ways that member staff are employed. So they have individual employment relationships, but also they can be employed by two or, or more um, members. So under the contract of employment, when it's an individual member um, who's employing a member staff, and there's an incident where an, an employee has experienced um, a form of sexual harassment, um, under their contract of employment, as is any employer, they would be raising it with their employing member. Um, but also, in the past, member staff who've come to us informally and, and have asked us and told us of that, those situations, we would, in, th in those circumstances, be encouraging the person to raise a, a complaint under their contract of employment. Um, however, if they felt that they were not able to do so, we would seek their uh, agreement to raise the matter on their behalf with their employee member. And in those circumstances, we would be advising the member to appoint an independent third party to, to investigate the complaint and to, and to resolve the complaint on their behalf because they were too close to it and it wouldn't be an impartial process. I think it's important to, to note that the, the code of um, the, what Lorna was talking about is separate to the, the code of conduct because of the employment and the contractual relationship. So if someone had a complaint against a member um, who was not a member of their own staff, so if it was a member of the, the, the parliament staff or it was a member of staff of another MSP, that would be dealt with through the, the code of conduct. The only reason that the circumstances that Lorna has described are not covered under the code of conduct is because um, the code of conduct can't trump employment legislation and that's where the employment yeah. uh, and contractual relationship comes in. So would, you, would you want me to describe how it would be dealt with in Yes, I, I think that, that would be really helpful to yeah, set, sure. set the scene for where, where we are currently. Yeah, so under the Code of Conduct, so if it was um, about um, a member staff who's employed um, by an, a member and they were complaining about another member, um, that would be dealt with under the Code of Conduct. And in that situation, the member of staff, um, again, they would, they would raise their complaint with their employing member. And the employing member would then come and seek advice in that regard. And they would, that would then be dealt with under the Code of Conduct um, for, for that situation. As it stands, the situation um, in the Code is that it would be 
then raised with the business manager for the party of the, mem of the, the alleged perpetrator. Um, we would then also, um, HR function can also then get involved in that situation. And as it stands in the Code of Conduct, we would be looking at conciliation as a first um, position. However, if the person believed that they you know, that they didn't want to do that or it was inappropriate in the circumstances, then the HR function would then investigate the matter, which would then go to um, yourselves to look at. And in the, the circumstances where the, the person making the, the allegation was an employee of the Scottish Parliament, would that be a different process? Yes. Yeah, that's a different process. Again, the HR function would be investigating it because we investigate all matters relating to complaints raised by our staff and that would then go through to the corporate body to deal with rather than the SPPA committee. Okay, thank you. Patrick. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Susan Duffy, I think, quite rightly said that uh, to have a proper response to this issue uh, requires a range of different actors, I guess, within the, the, the Parliament's uh, organisation to, to, to take an interest in the... You talked about the presiding officer's actions, the corporate body's actions, uh, HR, obviously, uh, political parties. This committee's remit is around members' conduct, and so we have to come to it from that angle. I just wonder if you can say a little bit more about the different permutations uh, of uh, who might be raising a complaint against whom or about whom thinking not just about member staff and parliamentary staff, but perhaps members of the public, contractors, other organisations who are here taking part in, in the work of the parliament. Um, I guess the thing that I'm not clear about in terms of this committee's take on the issue is to what extent does a member's involvement in that range of possible situations engage the code of conduct? Uh, as opposed to being exclusively dealt with by parliamentary bodies other than this committee? Yeah, um, the, the Code of Conduct, as you're, you're, you're aware, um, allows for anyone to make a complaint about the, the conduct of members. Um, in the vast majority of cases for people like the, the, the categories you've mentioned, members of the public, contractors and what have you, those complaints would go straight to the commissioner and it would be for the commissioner to decide whether there was a complaint that, that then had to go through the, the four-stage process which is set out in the, the Code of Conduct and in the legislation. There are exceptions to that, so those involve um, conduct in committees, which is a matter for the relevant committee convener, um, conduct in the chamber, which is a matter for the presiding officer, and general conduct, which is where we come into this picture. Um, so that's the, the um, part of the code that then um, comes into play where um, member staff and uh, the, the staff of the parliament raise complaints. So there are various different routes. It's quite a complex process. Um, but the, there are those three main categories, the, the, the complaints that go off to the commissioner um, and the complaints that are dealt within the, the parliament and those that are directly as a result of parliamentary business. So if, for example, a member, an MSP's member of staff uh, was to uh, make a complaint to their employer, to their MSP, uh, about something they'd experienced in relation to the behaviour of somebody else, perhaps a contractor or a you know, member of the public even, uh, who is taking part in a, in a meeting of the, of the parliament or, or in, in the business of the parliament, to what extent would HR or the parliament's bodies have a role in that? Or is that purely a matter for uh, the MSP's code of conduct in terms of how the employer handles that situation and, and supports their member of staff in, in resolving that complaint? Sorry, was that a complaint about the conduct of the well, somebody who's the not member. employed by a, by a member? No, of of, of a, anybody else who's who's you know, quite legitimately part of the, the the work of the parliament. Somebody attending a meeting, somebody uh, you know, a media organisation, what what have you? Yeah, th in that case, that would go straight to the commissioner. If it was a, a complaint about the conduct of a member, that would be for the commissioner to, to decide whether there was a complaint that was relevant under the code to be taken forward that way. Sorry, maybe I'm, I'm not quite being clear. It, it is a complex range of situations. If a, if a member receives a complaint 
from their member of staff about the behaviour of somebody else who is not a member, is there again purely that HR function in resolving that kind of complaint? Or is that a matter for holding the member accountable for the way they handle that complaint? Is that a matter for the Code of Conduct? Yeah, that, that would be a subsequent complaint. That, that, that would come after the, the, the handling of the, the initial complaint, um, which wouldn't be a matter for the Code of Conduct. But if there was any complaint about how the member had supported the person making the complaint, okay. that would be a legitimate, in my view, that would be a legitimate complaint under the Code. Is there a case for a single front door for all of this, a single point of contact, rather than this quite complex landscape, which, you know, if, if, if we're all finding it a little bit daunting to, to figure out our way through it, I suspect somebody who had less involvement with the Parliament might might also not be clear how to raise an issue. That, that's, that's, sorry. Sorry, I was going to say, that, that, I mean, that was the thinking behind setting up the, the helpline mm -hmm. for that very reason, because the helpline in itself wasn't going to be a mechanism whereby people could make reports. But recognising how complex the landscape was, the helpline was there so that if someone did have a, a, an issue that we would guide them through um, what process was the most appropriate um, to go down. But I think it's quite legitimate through all of this work that we're doing to, to look at that. Now, there are there are you know legitimate reasons for the complexity because there are a number yeah. of different relationships but i think it's an uh, i think it's incumbent upon us to look at whether how we can simplify that because ultimately what our goal is here is to make sure that if anyone feels that they have been harassed that we make it as painless as possible for them to be and as easy as possible for them to report that and for them to be supported in that that process okay thank you hey, alexander thank you convener can i talk a little bit about the, the survey that's been undertaken. Uh, can we talk about how the results of the survey are going to be analysed? Uh, and you talk about time scale being March, uh, and will the results of that survey be made public? Um, yes, we're committed to making the results of the, the, the survey public. And what we want to do is not just publish the analysis of the survey results, but also an action plan that we're going to, to take forward. And that's part of the reason for setting up this, this working group so that we can begin that, that process. Now, in terms of how the results will be analysed, we took a decision when we um, first set up the survey that we wanted to give people confidence that this would be confidential. And so therefore, we engaged a third party organisation called Progressive, who are very experienced uh, in, in the area of, of surveys, to, uh, to undertake and to administer the survey for us. So they receive all of the raw data. We do not see this. And they will analyse the response on our behalf. And they will then send a report um, to us. Obviously, that will then be for the, the corporate body for, for those results to be, to be considered. But it's always been um, our uh, intention that these are, are published. And we would look to try and do that during March. Survey, uh, a respondent identifies an individual. Uh, what actions will be taken with reference to that because of the confidentiality nature of the whole process? What we've done, we designed the questions to, to try and ensure that people didn't identify any individuals because the survey was a means of gathering uh, views on the, the culture within the parliament rather than being some kind of anonymous mechanism to, to make a, a complaint. Mm. So at, at certain points in the survey, we do put warnings into people to not identify any individuals. If any individuals were identified, then the uh, progressive who are analysing this, they would not take that into account and that, uh, that, that information would be, would be destroyed. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Could I just pick up a little bit on, on the, the survey? Uh, last week, uh, MSPs and others would have received an email saying that the, the survey, there'd been a, I think it was a very good response, was, was the expression used. Um, however, there was a decision to extend the deadline for a further week. Are you able to share with us what very good means, what yep. that percentage is, and the rationale if the return is very good for extending it for a further week? Yeah. Well, firstly, the reason that we wanted to extend it for another week is because I think when we, we set it, we thought, well, that that's you know that that seems a good time to do it at the end of the first week back. But then thinking about the fact that we've just had the Christmas and New Year break, we wanted to make sure that we could that we could basically ensure that people had sufficient time to, to fill it in. So we decided to go for a, for another week. Um, at the moment, we've obviously only got an interim response rate because the the survey doesn't close until tomorrow. But we are nudging over the sixty percent mark. And we've spoken to um, um, Progressive to try and, and benchmark this. 
And I think for normally for employee for employee surveys, um, a rate of a, a return rate of about fifty to seventy percent is usually considered um, pretty good. So I think they think this is not just an employee survey; that this is actually a, a very you know on the basis of what we've got at the moment, that's a good return rate. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much, uh, Just very quickly on, on on that point, do you have a breakdown of who's responded? The kind of proportion, so MSPs, MSP staff, other other kind of uh, other staff, will and that that will be published. And is there? Are you able to give us an idea of? you know, what groups have responded better than others, perhaps? Yeah. Um, just to say that when we do um, publish the results, that breakdown will be, be published. The breakdown will be, as in the survey, when people were asked to confirm whether they were Parliament staff, members, member staff, it won't be broken down any further than that so that we have no issues in terms of confidentiality. Um, we, we have a sort of interim um, breakdown. Um, now, one of the, the reasons I've been slightly hesitant is because we it's very easy to get a, a breakdown on the online surveys that we've had returned, but we have also um, issued a number of hard copy surveys to people who, for whatever reason, don't have access to a, a computer. So anything that we've got at the moment is only a, a sort of indication, uh, if, if you like. Um, we have had extremely um, high response rates from um, SPCB staff and from member staff as, as, as well. And um, and we have we've had a very good response uh, from from members as well. Um, thank you very much for that. And not one, not wanting in any way to obviously prejudge um, the findings of the survey, but I was wondering what kind of activities are in consideration if the survey does reveal that there's been uh, levels of of sexual harassment uh, within Parliament. Yeah. Um, we were already um, looking at things like our dignity at work policy, which, albeit that that applies um, to SPCB staff and how um, we deal with, with issues within that, also it's it's referenced uh, as one of the SPCB policies in the Code of Conduct, so essentially members are, are, are asked to abide by the spirit of that. So we already had some plans in place to look at our dignity at work policy to see whether or not we, we, we need to do, to do something in relation to that. We've done that regularly. We established that in 2004 and if memory serves we revised it in 2008 and, and 2011 as, as as well also what we are we are looking at is the issue of training because um, if we're looking at a, a culture shift we can do whatever we want in terms of processes and procedures and it's important that we do that but we also need to, to look at training for, for everyone in the, in the building so that people have an understanding of the impact that behaviours might have on people, what constitutes harassment. The survey also was asking about sexist behaviour, so again, we want to, to look at that. So whilst obviously we'll be guided by what comes out in the, the survey, there are already things that we're thinking about that will need to be taken forward regardless. Can I ask just very, very quickly as well? Uh, I think you've kind of partially mentioned it anyway, or, or, but, you know, historically, w how often were reviews into kind of procedures undertaken? We review our procedures all the time, so we're, we're constantly looking at them. So, and we also want to abide by best practice and ACAS codes and changes in legislation. So there our procedures as they are, are compliant with all of those. Um, with, we constantly look at um, new policies that are being uh, published and, and we look to see what we can learn from those. So we're ahead. always we're always doing that. Thank you. Aileen. Thanks, convener. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so I suppose you can't give any answers about this until you get the answers back and you, and you look at what you've got. But... Do you think that based on the, the phone line activity and the, and the feedback sessions so far that the current report and investigation sy systems have been adequate to deal with um, incidences of sexual harassment and have staff felt confident in engaging with them? I think that's... Uh... <laughs> It is difficult to, to prejudge and to be and to be honest, that's one of the reasons that we put that question into the, the survey because um as we were talking about, there are complexities around the reporting system. So it might be that people have felt that they weren't quite sure where to go or, or, or what to, to do. And the other thing was as I was saying that 
when we were thinking about the, the survey and looking at the, the reported um, rates being relatively low, we were very, very aware that that could potentially be because people didn't feel that they could report that for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important to us that we tried to capture that within the, 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 the survey. And it's why we've also asked in the survey, um, from memory, I think we've got a free text box, to ask people if there's anything else that we should be doing. And the reason for that is so that we can find out from people who have got, you know, for, you know people who've gone through this, this, this process, what they, they feel about it. And the survey will be, that's our means of sort of mass engagement, but we'll also be engaging, you know, with our staff and others on a more informal basis, just to try and, and get a bit more um, flesh in the bones of that. Do you think then that the publicity around this and the survey in itself will be helpful in actually focusing minds on what's appropriate, what isn't, helping people to maybe think about change in behaviour that they might not have considered to be inappropriate in the first place? Do you think that might be an outcome? I, I, I think so, and I really, really hope so, and I think it's it's one of the really positive things that we're shining a light on, on this. We're looking at trying to do something about this, and I know from my own experience within the Parliament that people are talking about this. This has been actively discussed, and people are thinking about their, their, their behaviour. They're thinking about how, uh, how their behaviour impacts on, on other people, and it is very encouraging to me that this is the subject of a lot of discussion, and I'm really hoping that that will continue. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um um, looking at the, the Dignity at Work policy, it does cover those instances where people may not consider that their behaviour is having a detrimental impact. Um, and the, the Dignity at Work policy actually makes it very clear that it's not the intent that's the main thing, it's the impact. And it's very much focused on the person experiencing the behaviour. But I think there's a job for us to do to raise awareness of all of that. Um, as we said, we've reviewed this policy in the past, but not for a number of years. And we're kind of anticipating that one of the things the survey will show up that the people aren't as aware as we would like them to be. So I think there's an exercise there to make sure that, that um, individuals take responsibility for that, but also line managers are pr promoting awareness of that policy. Okay. Could I have a further question, convener? Uh, thank you. I think actually as well what has come out this morning from your evidence is that although the committee are looking at specifically at the sexual harassment issue, you've spent quite some time this morning talking about um, the, the dignity at work policy, you've talked about diversity and inclusion strategy, you, you've talked about um, staff feeling safe, valued and respected and a zero tolerance to harassment. And I suppose then maybe the question is whether or not this has lessons to be widened out a bit. So for example, um, the, these, these things would sort of perhaps cover all equality strands if you like, and if you if you look at the spectrum um, of sexual harassment, then it's on a spectrum which includes violence against women uh, and very serious issues of violence against women. But if you look at something um, like religious beliefs, so for example, there's a rise in persecution of Christians around the world, but part of that spectrum might just be um, discrimination at, at a, a lower level if you like. So even um, the government's own statistics last year, for example, showed a rise in hate crimes against Catholics. So do you think that actually this whole procedure, might, there might be lessons to be learned about how people respect and value other issues such as um, Christian or religious beliefs? I mean, absolutely. I mean, what underpins the diversity and inclusion strategy that, that we set out is it covers it covers every, it covers all protected characteristics and not just protected characteristics. Essentially, what we what we say in that that strategy is that we want people to feel valued and to be able to succeed whoever they are and wherever they come from. So that the diversity and inclusion strategy covers the the whole spectrum. And when I was talking about the work that we had done, for example, in relation to setting up a women in leadership program, the idea was always that we would do things like this and we would use that as a template for work that we would do in relation to all forms of, of discrimination and so that's why we've also set up a number of, of, of networks um, not just a, a women's network but um, LGBTI network, carers network I won't mention them all because I will forget one and I'll get into trouble for that but that was the reason why we were, we, we were doing that I would just add that the the um, in diversity and inclusion strategy that we've mentioned a few times today is partly our response to our public sector duty under the Equality Act 
um, to eliminate discrimination. Um, and the three main aims in that policy are to diversify the, the Parliament's workforce, to create an inclusive working environment, um, and to have the services in place that are accessible for the people that we engage with. So that's the, the very aim there, and all of that work um, is going along alongside the work that we're doing just now in relation to um, specifically on sexual harassment. Um, the other thing that we're working on as well, which is relevant here, are the recommendations that came out of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform. And there are a whole range of recommendations there that are specifically about diversity. And again, the, the board that Susan mentioned earlier has got that work programme to, to factor into everything else that we're doing at the moment too. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can I just pick up a little bit about the phone line and ask specifically about what activity there's been on the phone line and whether you feel that it's fulfilling its purpose? Yeah. Yeah, so we have had um, nine calls um, over the lifetime of um, well, since November, okay. yeah, <laughs> and since November. So, but that is, I think it's important to note that that's only one route where people can seek advice. So, we know that people are seeking advice from parties who have, and parties have their own arrangements in place, and there's a number of issues being dealt with there. So, it is the only one route where people want to have clarification about what procedure applies in this in the situation that they're facing. In terms of um, meeting its purpose, it's it's one of other, you know, one of many ways that people can seek advice and raise complaints. So it's to it's to supplement the existing employee assistance program where people can actually contact an, an independent third party to seek advice on harassment issues or other matters. Um, and also through parties and through their line management or through their employer. So it's one of many ways. But what, what we are going to do is we're going to review the current arrangements to ensure that there's no barriers for people to, to access that and maybe look to have that um, um, supported externally. There had been some concerns voiced at the time of the, the launch of, of the, the phone line about the limited hours that it was operating um, and that it may be difficult for, for some staff in the building to contact that hotline privately um, during those, those hours, which were essentially working hours. So have those hours changed or has there been consideration been given to altering the, the operating hours of the phone line? So in terms of the operation of the, the phone line, it is nine to five, as you said, and but we've made it clear to people that they can phone another helpline where they can get that support, and that support is 24, 24 hours a, a day, um, 365 days a week. Uh, it's important to note that, again, there's not been that many calls to that um, employee assistance helpline, so people you know, we, we have those provisions in place. There's other routes that other people are taking, going to the party, for example, or raising matters with their employer. So it's only one indication of, of the activity that's going on in the Parliament. And as, as Lorna said, we, 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 we moved to set this up really quickly, but the intention always was to look at how it was operating and to see whether we could make an improvements to that as we go forward based on the experience that we had. So the, the second helpline that, that you're talking about there, who operates that and what's the...? Yeah, that's, that's operated by um, a th a one of our contractors and it's through our employee assistance programme. It's a counselling service also, so people can phone that helpline, get advice on, on matters that are affecting their employment, quite general matters as well. Um, if they're feeling that they need to talk through their experiences to build confidence, they can get um, counselling face-to-face with, with, um, with one of our providers and to um, enable them to take steps that they want to take in, in terms of if they want to report something. So was this a helpline that was already available? Yeah. It's been available for 10 plus years, yeah. Okay, so so when when you were talking about having a one point of access and one point of information, we already have one there, so we're we're sort of confusing the issue by having two. Well, the when the employee assistance program is is 
very quite, it's a general um, advice line. So it's about if you're experiencing um, matters relating to your employment, so it could be, um, you know, discrimination or harassment or bullying, for example. So people, what they will do is they will give advice in general terms to support that person, to, to have a safe place for that person to express how they're feeling and to, to get build confidence about how they want to take action. The, the, the purpose of the helpline is purely to help people navigate around our procedures. It's That was the main purpose of that because what we were, um, when we, when the issue, um, when we went to respond to the, the, the particular issue, we looked at the procedures and we were surprised about how com complex they were because there was various routes um, that um, contractors need to go through and, and member staff and our staff. So we wanted to have um, trained staff to be able to um, give that specific advice to that person. And at the time, it would we you know we we had to act quickly and we couldn't then get our contractors to take that responsibility on they needed time to then build up their knowledge about our procedures because they are very very complex so the idea being is that we will look to towards extending um the 24-hour helpline through an, ex an independent provider and and seek to uh, build up their knowledge around our procedures so given that the 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 Parliament and, and HR has, has sort of looked at this anew and, the, and realised how complex the landscape is for someone trying to navigate their way through that, depending on who employs them and, and, and who, who has, they feel has been harassing them. Um, do you think that it's time that we, we had a, a much less complex um, system for people to, to work in? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kate, did you want to come on? Going back, thank you very much. Going back to the process of uh, working through the, the code of conduct and investigating a complaint through that, how do you, I mean, after the complaint has been dealt with and presumably that sanctions have been imposed, do you do any sort of monitoring in terms of whether either the, the individual who's been sanctioned is actually carrying out the... Um, the penalty, as it were, and in what ways do you support the person who's complained after the complaint process has come to an end? Well, under the Code of Conduct with members who have been sanctioned, um, we don't have any formal procedure for monitoring the, the impact of that afterwards. We may informally keep in touch with the business manager, the relevant business manager who's been involved in the process to see how things have um, hopefully changed since the sanction has been imposed. But we don't have any formal procedure for, for doing that. Um, in terms of complaints that would be dealt with uh, through our HR system, that would be um, a matter for the, the relevant line manager, office head, group head, whoever was the, the senior person in the line, um, and it would be part of their ongoing responsibilities to monitor behaviour to see that the, the issue had been properly addressed for the longer term and not just the specific incident that had led mm -hmm. to, to complaints. Mm -hmm. I can add to that if you want in terms of what things we have done in the past for, for behaviour that, <coughs> that the person wants um, support to modify their own behaviour. So we've had um, opportunity to get one-to-one um, -one coaching or counselling, um, and that's something that we have offered people in the past. In terms of the, the support for individuals who have raised complaints, they, um, again, there's opportunity for that person to go through some counselling. Um, they may also feel that they want some um, skills and, and confidence to be able to um, raise matters. So, because the, the best way of addressing these issues is to be um, timely and nipping things in the bud. So, it's, there's things that you know we will look at lessons learned and think about how we can improve relationships and and how we all contribute to that. And as a brief supplementary to that, how, how are they supported through the complaints process? So somebody who's complained, because I imagine, you know, you f you must feel very isolated. Yeah. So, in in terms of how things are set up uh, currently, um, there's a bit of a Chinese wall. If if we receive a complaint in the HR function, we will ensure that the person who is and, and who's the alleged perpetrator is also getting support from from the HR colleagues going through that process. Because yeah, it can be 
in particular when situations are very heightened and, and, and as they are now, um, they, they, it can be very isolating and, and uh, experience. So, you know, we want to ensure that everyone has been supported through that process. Mm. Equally, they can, um, we encourage those people to contact the Employee Assistance Programme to get counselling support as well to go through that. And you're, you, the Code of Contact... Code of Conduct states that in all cases opportunities for conciliation will be pursued in the first instance. What does that mean? We would look to, um, um, well it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the individual so it's not one size fits all, you know, I think we'll have to remember that. But it could include things like HR being involved or HR appointing an external uh, mediator to be involved in that process. And th those are things that we have done in the past where we have brought in mediators to, to try and resolve issues. So it depends on the circumstances. It depends on what the person wants to do. Um, it de you have to go into those conciliation meetings in good faith. You have to be committed to resolve matters. If two parties aren't committed to doing that, then there is no point in actually um, progressing that. And it, then it's then we need to then look at the formal um, uh, procedure. And, and I think in some of the discussions that we're going to be having about um, how we can best deal with issues of sexual harassment, we obviously say within the, the Code of Conduct that conciliation will be pursued in the first instance in all cases. Now we have to look at whether that is appropriate in cases of sexual harassment. So, A really brief um, further point. Do you think, I mean, you mentioned that you regularly review the procedure. Was it the publicity that bounced you into this particular review or would it have happened anyway? So in terms of the member staff, um, their, their procedures, that those were reviewed just um, before the last election. In terms of the Dignity Work Policy, that was in plan. Um, we, we formed the Dignity Work Board last year and under um, the, their work programme, we were going to be reviewing the Dignity Work arrangements. Um, to ensure that it goes beyond just protected characteristics, it, goes, it actually ensures that all of us are able to work in an environment where we can contribute and flourish in our roles. So that was the intention. So it, was some, it's, it goes beyond just legal requirements and compliance. It goes to, um, a, a, you know, to enable a culture where, where we could all contribute. Thank you. Well, to see that under the, the strategy which goes until the, the end of this session we were looking right across the piece in terms of diversity and inclusion and some of the, the, the issues that Elaine Smith raised earlier were already on our radar but it's fair to say that this publicity has meant there's been a specific focus on sexual harassment in particular which we didn't anticipate when we set out on this current review. Thank you. Thank you. I've not had any further indication that members have... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Patrick. Um, thanks very much. I, I think um, this has all been really helpful in uh, explaining how things operate under the current rules. Obviously, one of the things this committee will have to consider is whether there should be changes to the Code of Conduct. Now, I don't know whether you feel comfortable as, as Parliament officials expressing a, a, a very clear view about changes that might be necessary, but are there any areas of the current code that you think you would want to draw to our attention that should be considered for changes? I think we, we, we've touched on quite a few earlier. I mean, the, the issue that Susan just mentioned about um, the code obliging conciliation in all cases, we, we do sometimes find that we're looking for ways around about that um, because we do have situations where that's not entirely appropriate. It's not what the person experiencing the behaviour um, needs. Um, some of the other areas that we, we have some difficulty around about, and again Susan mentioned the interplay between the code and the dignity at work policy, the code obliging members to abide by all corporate body policies, but the dignity at work policy specifically says that it doesn't apply to members, so there's a contradiction there. We kind of get around that by um, the corporate body's position being that members are obliged to abide by the spirit of the, the, the dignity at work policy. What does that really mean? Um, that's not explained anywhere in either the dignity at work policy or in the code. Um, we've touched on the fact that the, the code doesn't um, deal with complaints by member staff against the employing member. Again, the code's silent on that. There are very good reasons for that, but maybe that could be made more explicit on the face of the code. 
Um, something else that um, maybe gives us some concern is the guidance that supports the code refers to complaints being normally raised within one year. Um, that is not an automatic barrier. Um, there are ways in which complaints that are out with that time scale can be dealt with. But that gives us some concern that we know from experience that lots of the, the issues that we're, we're talking about today can be incubating for years, even decades, before people feel confident to raise them. Um, this might present another barrier. Yes, we can explain that the, the complaint can still be taken, but people looking at the code might think, yeah. um, what do I have to do to get this um, a, taken on board? Um, Lorna's hinted at, I think, some of the conflicts of interest that may arise in the HR office when it's trying to support the people that are raising complaints, also the people that are um, the, the, the subject of the complaint, um, and the, the, the lens that the HR office has to go to to make sure that they're providing that, that direct support. So these are all some of the things that, that we struggle with when we manage um, issues round about it. The final thing I would say is that even the terminology for this category of complaints under the Act, it, it talks about excluded complaints, mm -hmm. and there's a real mixed message there. I mean, yeah. okay, that would take a, a statutory change, but anyone building up the courage to lodge a complaint, when they look at the legislation, when they look at the code, the code and they see excluded complaint, there's bound to be a bit of confusion there, and that's maybe something that the committee could consider as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I haven't had any further indication that there's any questions from, from members. I'd like to thank the panel for coming along today and uh, giving your evidence. I think uh, the committee has found that really helpful. Um, and I'll suspend briefly to allow you to leave. Okay. Um, thank you. So agenda item six is for the committee to consider whether to accord recognition to the proposed CPGs on autism and life sciences. And I invite members to make comments. Um, perhaps we could start with uh, the CP proposed CPG on autism. Hi. Sorry, no, no, so, no, Elaine. Uh, yeah, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, personally, I've long felt that, that there is a miss in the Parliament not to have such a CPG, but I do think that focusing on what, what CPGs are about, i.e. parliamentary and their nature, rather than um, public meetings, uh, is an important point that to be remembered. So I would, um, I would certainly want to support that application. Uh, similarly, I think it's, uh, there's a need in the Parliament for a CPG focused on this and um, the only thing I would say about Graham is as he's a convener of the, the committee, other committee I sit on and he does do things well you know he gives it his all so I would hope that he would recognise that point and would ensure that it isn't just a, a public meeting So are the committee content to uh, support 
Oh, the autism CPG. Thank you. Um, and moving on to life sciences. Does anyone have any comments about uh, that proposed CPG? <laughs> Thanks, convener. Uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting um, that the the two it wasn't appropriate for it to to come under um, the remit of the existing group on science and technology. And, and I was asking the question because I thought perhaps in the last session, where there was a life science cross party group, that might have been because there wasn't a group on science and technology, which is why I was trying to get to the bottom of that. But um, I, you know, I take the point that, that groups can, of course, work together and cross-reference and have meetings mm -hmm. together. So I think that's a legitimate point for uh, Kent Gibson to have made. I was also particularly interested in what exactly the purpose of the group is, because it does say in the registration form to support the delivery of the Scottish Life Sciences Strategy. And I think some of the questioning that I was doing myself and that Alexander mm -hmm. Stewart was doing was maybe to get to a wee bit more to the bottom of that and whether it was just to support it or whether it was to actually scrutinise it to perhaps make that strategy better as it went mm -hmm. along. So that, that was my only slight um, reservation about that. And But I think um, Kenneth Gibson did answer that. But also, uh, again, Patrick Harvey raised the issue about the organisations who make up the, the cross-party group. Uh, and I do think that, um, that they seem to be very, at the moment, very industry focused. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, again, Kenneth Gibson did say that, that they were trying to widen that out. So, you know, with those, those issues on the record and having been aired, I think um, I, would, I would personally um, support the setup of the cross-party group. Any other comments from members, Pat, Alexander? I, as, as I indicated, I mean, I think it, it needs to be challenged, and I think that's what's going to happen in this process. Uh, I mean, we all can sign up to the, the, the philosophy behind it, uh, but I do think that, that as I say, that the cross-party group needs to be very focused about what it's trying to achieve, uh, and I think Mr Gibson gave us that indication that that would be the case, uh, uh, and, I, and I look forward to maybe going along to see what does actually happen mm -hmm. at some of the meetings in future if we, we progress it, just to see how that does develop, because it could become quite focused or it could become quite broad, mm -hmm. and I think it needs to be focused uh, or it will lose what its objectives really are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kate. So I think this goes to the heart of the big question on CPGs, which is, should you go broad and have fewer? or go in depth and have far more. And I do think there are far too many. But at the same time, if you want to look at life sciences properly, you can't do it within the science and technology. I think it would be better if, if I mean, I'd be more reluctant to support life sciences one because I think that you could maybe have a spin-off within the CPG on <coughs> science and technology, especially if you're just having events. You know, you know. Patrick. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to support the creation of the, the group. Uh, I've made the, the point in the past that um, where there are some CPGs, and I, I don't think it explicitly applies to, to this one, where there are some CPGs with a, a very limited range of external membership, uh, entirely in some cases composed of organisations with vested commercial interests, there is, a, there is a danger that that could tip over into becoming a, a lobbying exercise. Uh, rather than a, a genuinely cross-party group. As I say, I don't think that's a, 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 a very high concern in relation to this one because there's a, a range of, of academic and other interests, but uh, I think it's something that we might review at some future time. I think that's a, a, a case that I've made in the past. Jamie. Yeah, just, to, just to repeat the points, I think about making sure there's more representation from groups that uh, you know, to, to encourage women to get into life sciences, as that is one of the stated aims of the CBG, to, to repeat and to echo Kate's points on re uh, regional representation as well. I think that's very important. Um, but I'd also support the group as well. Okay. So are the committee uh, content to approve the mm -hmm. life sciences cross-party group? Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure uh, both uh, MSPs will be informed formally by the clerks uh, later today. Um, and as previously agreed, we now move into private session. <laughs>